During the height of prohibition in the United States, school officials caught 10 students drinking gin in one of their rooms at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. While not expelled, all 10 were penalized for their infraction and told they must quit all extracurricular activities at the school. This particularly stung for one of the students, who had just recently risen to the rank of editor-in-chief of the Dartmouth Jack-O-Lantern, the university-sponsored humor magazine. Forced to abandon the position, the student realized he could still continue writing for the magazine, at least, without the administration's knowledge, if he simply convinced his friends at the magazine to publish his work under a pen name alias. And so, he began signing his submissions with only his middle name, Sois. Upon graduating from Dartmouth, the student began attending Lincoln College in Oxford, intending to earn a doctorate degree in philosophy, but he left the university before doing so. Instead, he returned to the U.S. and put the writing and drawing skills he had cultivated at the Jack-O-Lantern to good use, submitting writing and drawings to various magazines, book publishers, and ad agencies. Soon, he was making enough steady money as a freelance writer that he was able to settle down and marry his girlfriend. Not long after, he was doing so well the two were able to enjoy a wealthy lifestyle and travel the world together. He would soon publish his first book, an illustrated book of collected children's sayings called, well, it was called Boners. And it was followed by a sequel, um, More Boners. The success of these encouraged him to write and publish a few children's books, some in prose, but others in a playful style of verse he was quite adept at writing. His publishing career would be put on hold during World War II, however, when he would at first start concentrating on political cartoons, and then eventually join the army, becoming commander of the animation department of the first motion picture unit of the U.S. Army Air Force, where he would work on propaganda and military training films such as Our Job in Japan, which would eventually be expanded into the Academy Award-winning documentary Design for Death, and the Private Snafu series of animated shorts, which educated young GIs on security, troop morale, and even proper hygiene habits. But it was after the war was over that he would enjoy his greatest success, as throughout the 50s he would return to publishing children's books, this time mostly concentrating on that unique, whimsical, rhyming verse. Many of these books would go on to become enduring, undeniable classics, bringing him more wealth, a publishing empire, and numerous accolades, including a special Pulitzer Prize in 1984 for his contribution over nearly half a century to the education and enjoyment of America's children and their parents. And yet, it's tough to call him a household name exactly, at least not his real name, because very few know the name Theodore Seuss Geisel. But his pen name, well, that's a different story. Since his Dartmouth days, he had added doctor to the pen name, despite never actually getting that doctorate at Oxford. Oh, and he had also eventually begrudgingly accepted that most people were dead set on mispronouncing his middle name as it was spelled, and so even he stopped referring to himself as Seuss, as it was meant to be pronounced, and instead accepted that he was forevermore to be known as Dr. Seuss. The year is 2003, and Universal Pictures and DreamWorks Pictures are teaming up to launch the next big children's fantasy blockbuster franchise with Dr. Seuss's The Cat in the Hat. Welcome once again to Failure to Franchise, the show dedicated to some of Hollywood's most infamous mistakes, missteps, and misfires. This is Trev. And I'm Chris, sharing a lot with the man of the month, including a proud Canadian heritage, a love for hockey, and probably a very hoarse voice from round one of the Stanley Cup playoffs. <laughs> yes, we, this, is, uh, this is Failure to Franchise After Dark, <laughs> yeah. by the, the, the sexy tones I'm hearing over there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. Well, congratulations on uh, the first round of the playoffs, Chris. Yes. Yes. Let's let's make it clear that it is for the Oilers and not the yes. Leafs. But but yeah. that's why Mike Myers he he loves the Leafs. We're going to talk in depth about Mike Myers. But uh, uh, yeah, it's cool to see two Canadian teams make it past the first round. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, go on. Yeah. You know what, Chris? Uh, in honor of you, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull for the Oilers this year. Oh, because I really thank got you. I got no other horse in the race at this point, so yeah. I might as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, well, you've already alluded to it. Um, it's the start of a new month. It's the start of a new theme. And you know you know what time it is, Chris? You know what time of year it is? 
you know, the trees are starting to turn a little more. The, the green is starting to pop out. You know, the cold weather is going away. So, of course, it, that can only mean it's Mike Mayers. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah. Um, so we will be spending this month. As Chris already said, looking at a Canadian legend, maybe one of only like, I don't know what, three Canadian legends. There's not two. You guys don't have too many. A good um, hand, a handful, at least. There's oh, it's like, like comedic legends. There's Red Green, Mike oh. Myers, and I think that's it. Um, you, bite your, you bite your tongue. You bite your tongue. <laughs> but we'll, there's an entire month dedicated to Mike Myers. And you know what, Chris? I would love to talk about movies like Wayne's World, Austin Powers, even Shrek. You know, movies, movies I enjoy, Mm -hmm. but no, I had to come up with the dumb idea for this podcast where we can't, we can't look at those movies because those movies were successful and had sequels. So instead we're going to be looking at uh, two Mike Meyer, uh, Mike Meyer's failures, uh, starting this uh, episode with 2003's The Cat in the Hat. Chris, tell us a little bit about The Cat in the Hat. Correct. Yes. Um. Uh, it is directed by Bo Welch. Um. This is his first and only feature. He was. A <laughs> you don't pro- say. <laughs> you don't say. Yeah. He was a production designer for Tim Burton and Barry Sonnenfeld. Mm-hmm. Um. This we'll was, talk about some of his credits. Like. Definitely. Definitely. Uh. This was written by a comedy trio. Trev. Mm. Some of my favorite people. I would say. Mm-hmm. Alec Berg, David Mandel, and Jeff Schaefer, who wrote for Seinfeld, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and also wrote The Great Euro Trip, which I also, I love that movie. I do too, um, yeah. All three of them went on to hugely successful careers outside of that, running their own shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alec Berg uh, was a showrunner for the, well, it's going on right now, it's the HBO series Barry. Then uh, David Mandel uh, was the showrunner for Veep, and uh, Jeff Schaefer was the showrunner for uh, The League. So, mm-hmm. All incredibly funny, funny people. Yeah. And you know um, what? I also want to toss out, because uh, I don't know if you noticed this, Chris. I want to give a quick shout out to David Mandel for also being the co-creator and one of the showrunners of a show that I love. And I think I've brought up before the Clerks animated series. Right. David right, Mandel. Right, right. Yeah, it was him and Kevin Smith worked on that. And that to me is still like the best like Kevin Smith thing. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, of course, this is based on the 1957 book of the same name by Dr. Seuss. Um the budget of the film was a staggering $109 million. Uh, domestically, it made $101 million. And worldwide, it made $133.9 million. So really, this was an international bomb. I, I, I find this did okay stateside, but uh, internationally, just completely fell flat. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I mean, obviously, we'll talk about our feelings on the film and everything, but I, and I didn't do like research on this element of it. I do wonder... I don't I mean, do you know offhand like how much Dr. Seuss travels across the world? I know I'm not I'm not here to say only America knows about Dr. Seuss. Sure. Dr. Seuss, of course, is an American author. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I'm guessing, you know, I'm guessing he's been translated quite a bit. But I wonder about that because his language and the rhyming scheme is so precise. Exactly. Like I've wondered about how much he's like been translated and how like kind of prevalent Dr. Seuss just as a concept is around the world. He must be pretty um, stagnant to the, the Americas. Truly, and because of the reasons you just said, his 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 uh, 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 writing style is so precise. Yeah, and it's, it's all so, wordplay. Yeah, it, yes, exactly. And um, I don't think you can get away with that, you know, in German. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, it, it it wasn't a huge shock that this maybe didn't play internationally, mind you. Uh, the Grinch. Who Stole yeah. Christmas, Christmas that came out in 2000 did do quite well. That had a budget of $123 million uh, and it went on to make $345 million worldwide. So that was kind of the catalyst to say, hey, let's hit the ground running. Let's make a bunch of these Dr. Seuss movies for number two with Cat in the Hat, which ultimately uh, kiboshed the entire plan. <laughs> yeah, at least on a live action front. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, and we'll discuss that as well. But I guess like, but let's just start with the man of the hour before we get into the Seuss of it all and <laughs> the specific backstory of this movie. Sure. Chris, I obviously want to ask because this month is dedicated to him and I'll let you go first as a fellow Canadian. Mike Myers. Uh, that's it. That's your prompt. Mike right. Myers. There you go. Talk, talk to me about Mike Myers. So growing up, I had uh, mainly three comedy heroes as a child. Uh, Jim Carrey, Chris Farley, and Mike Myers. Um, movies like Ace Ventura, uh, Tommy Boy, and Austin Powers just were the movies that I recited the most um, as a kid. I used to do all the. I used to do the voices. I used to do the acting out and like with 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 my family. And I was just kind of always wanted to be the kind of class clown because of those three. And what I love so much about Mike Myers 
is he is maybe one of the most wholesome celebrities that are just mega famous. You know, he has such a wholesome attitude to fame and also being a proud Canadian. And I think what's so cool about seeing him, you know, okay, this is what it is. Okay, US, the, the US, your your mother country is <laughs> way Interesting more. Interesting way to put it, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is uh, very patriotic, very nationalistic for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of Canadians are quite humble. You know, we don't, we don't really, you know, we're not flying the flag in front of our house uh, up and down every street. You know what I mean? So when somebody like Mike Myers shows up and he makes it gigantic in Hollywood and he makes it known with his biggest movies, with everything that he is super Canadian, so proud, loves the Leafs. I think it's just so wholesome. And there's not a lot of Canadian celebs that do that even. Like like there's there's Mike Myers, you know, Ryan Reynolds, Michael J. Fox, Seth Rogen. These, Jim these are guys. Jim Carrey, of course. Yeah, of course. But, but these guys exude you know, being Canadian, you know, they, it's, it's, it's just, it's nice to see. Um, and you know, between the years of 1997 and 2004, which was, you know, uh, the Austin powers and Shrek Two, the height of Mike Myers powers. Um, you'd never know that he was the biggest star on the earth. You know what I mean? Like he never, he, he's never, he's not, he's not like a red carpet guy, you know, he's yeah. not in, in big into, you know, you know, he's a little older, but he's not big into controversy. Like he just makes his art and he goes away. He makes his art and he goes away. And I love that about him. It's interesting you say that because that's I was talking uh, about Mike Myers recently since we were doing this podcast. And I was mentioning that this is our theme. And I did mention something about him that I think totally ties into what you just said. It's that what's different about Mike Myers from a lot of his peers of the time and a lot of other comedic stars who are comparable to him. Jim Carrey being the most obvious example in my head. Yeah. Is Jim Carrey is very manic and outrageous on screen and also when he's promoting Yes. Like off screen, Jim Carrey's always on. You think of the, the classic Jim Carrey appearances at the MTV Movie Awards during his whole like run, you know, where there was, you're always looking forward to the Jim Carrey moment. And you'd watch his press tours because he was just always being Jim Carrey. I love music. I love every kind of music, but recently I've really started to get into this thrash metal music. <laughs> I don't know, there's something about it, man, that I just can't let go. <laughs> it's great it's great there's this one band out that's called uh napalm death and uh and it's so hilarious i mean that i I listened to this album i started listening to this album and it was literally i'm not exaggerating that was it (laughs) you know and i thought you know someday this guy's gonna want to slow down and do some duets You don't bring me flowers. (laughs) I'm a little bit country. (laughs) And Mike Myers is so outrageous and manic on screen. Yeah. And then you watch interviews with him and he's so quiet. Um, Yeah, no, there's a show on Canadian television. I grew up in Toronto and there's a show on Canadian television called The Pig and Whistle which was a, uh, it was supposed to be like, somebody knows it from Canada. And to hear it on American TV is just like going, what? I've been transported. It's, uh, it's a show that like, is, takes place on a British pub set. And it's like, come in to the pig and whistle, come in. And they have like cheeky, chappy, cockney dancers, like Mary Poppins, you know? Uh-huh. And uh, I saw it as a kid and I, I went to my parents and I went, I want to do that. And so I took tap dancing lessons from these people. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, they taught you well? They taught me how to do jazz dancing and ballroom and Mm cha-cha-cha. And I can tap dance and... He's so soft-spoken. And he strikes me as the type of person who takes comedy very seriously and takes, like, you know, it as as an art, as a craft, and wants to think of it and speak of it that way. But I think it also speaks to what you said about a certain layer, like, well, a certain layer of humbleness, but we'll, as we get into the review too, I also want to talk about, I think a lot of this comes from who his comedic hero is, or at least one of his main comedic heroes. And that's Peter Sellers. Right. And Peter Sellers is another guy who you look at Inspector Clouseau or the party. He's like so ridiculous on screen. And then you watch interviews with him and he was a very kind of, you know, traditional stuffy British actor, very serious. Totally. And I think Mike Myers maybe took that on a little bit and said, I want to be Peter Sellers again. 
in all the best ways and maybe some of the worst ways, which we'll yeah. discuss yeah. as we talk about him. It's really poking fun of the, the spy James genre. James Bond, Matt Helm, In Like Flint, all the movies uh, from the 60s, because, you know, they're, every swinger in the 60s was like something by day, like a tennis player and then a secret agent at night. <laughs> right. Like in the 70s, it was like, you know, they're a family by day and then they're in a band by night. You know, that's a partridge family. Mm -hmm. like Josie mm -hmm. and the Pussycats or even mm -hmm. Fred, Fred Flintstone was in the way outs, you know. Right. But right. in the 60s, everybody had to be a secret agent, you know? Yeah, that was, it, was ex it was expected of That's you. That's what you do, baby, yeah. <laughs> Explain me. What, what about you? I want to throw the question back at you. Like, what, what, is, what does Mike Myers mean to you? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm obviously, because, you know, I'm old as dirt. Um, <laughs> I was aware of Mike Myers before probably you were even, like, a born, you know? <laughs> I mean, he, so he joins SNL in, in 1989, and he's there till 95. That's his run. And that cast, that that late 80s into the 90s cast, that's like my everybody has their SNL cast. That was their first like coming to awareness of SNL cast. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was born in 80. So that was mine. You know, I obviously I went back and watched the previous seasons and reruns. But when I was getting into SNL as a young kid, it was that cast. It was the Mike Myers, Dana Carvey cast, Phil totally. Hartman. Yeah. You know, and so well, I, I loved all of the characters on there. And then, yeah, I mean, like I just mentioned in the intro, 1992 Wayne's World. Oh, my God. You couldn't yeah. find... I mean, we were all just so obsessed with Wayne's World 1992. That movie was a phenomenon. She's a big swing. Arty, 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 arty. Still love it. I can still put it on today and crack up at it. Mm -hmm. I'm here to defend 1993's So I Married an Axe Murder. <laughs> I, like the, I like that movie. And Wayne's World 2 is one of the rare great comedy sequels i yeah, think to totally um and then and then he takes a little break from movies but austin powers 1997 you know the 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 storyline in austin powers is that it was kind of a little bit of a theatrical bomb and mm -hmm. really blew up bigger on uh video and cable not to be like one of those guys not to be a hipster <laughs> but i saw it in the theater and i like instantly knew it was genius i remember being one of the people telling people like well you got it you didn't see this one in the theater you got to catch it on video trust me it's great you know and like i said so that run from like wayne's world up to I think for me, like probably like I quite liked Austin Powers 2 at the time. Um, and obviously I like Shrek in 2001, 2002 gold member. I am not I'm in that camp who's not a gold member fan. Right. That's when it ever that's when it started to like peter out for me a little bit. And, uh, you know, so but I, I'm not going to deny that run. Great SNL cast member. And from 92 to 2001, I was very much on board with him as like a movie presence as well. And so, yeah. and like you said, I really, I, I, I have like, we'll talk about his issues, but in general, I have nothing against the guy in a, in a big way. Yeah. You know, I just think he's, he's, he can be very funny. And then we'll talk about how I feel about him today later. I remember when Austin Powers came out and I was, uh, we, I was, I guess, well, man, if that was 97, I was nine. Mm -hmm. So I remember in elementary school, people were talking about Austin Powers. Yep. Like children being like, oh, I was like my parents rented it and I watched a little bit of, of it. And then it, like the word was spreading through my elementary school, you know, and then my parents had rented it when it came out and we all sat down as a family to watch it. And I remember getting like very, you know, of course, there's a lot of sexual innuendo, which is a main thing in Mike Myers uh, comedy, which we'll get to with Cat in the Hat. Um, but I think there's so many things that made me like feel uneasy with my parents. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, a like, lot of yeah, vagina. I mean, a lot like, of vagina. Yeah, totally. Or like having like yeah, when they have sex in the sauna, or sorry, in the sauna in the, in the hot tub. I don't think I recognized what was going on until maybe a year later when I had the talk. <laughs> you know what I mean? I say, hello, vicar. That's the spot, all right. That's the spot right there. Look at that now. Well, good God. Like there's so many of those moments that were seminal to me with that film. And then, yes, of course, I grew with those other two movies. And when two and three came out, I was like peak young adolescent boy, yeah. you know? So those movies were the funniest movies I've ever seen in my entire life, you know? So, yeah, this guy, it's amazing, too, because even even when you, you know, you, you don't really like Goldmember, mm -hmm. which is fine. You know, I know a lot of people that don't like it as much, right? But... It's undeniable how iconic he even makes some of his bad things be. You know what I mean? Like, like Goldmember as a character is still like, he's super quotable, you know? Or like uh, um, when uh, his, his dad is in it, Michael Caine's in the movie. There are only two things I can't stand in this world. People who are intolerant of other people's cultures and the Dutch. 
You know, like uh, there, there's there's so many scenes that are just so incredibly quotable and getting Beyonce before she was Beyonce, you know, mm-hmm. I just think Mike Myers is just he's like he's like an old soul that's ahead of his time. But also, like you said, he he takes his craft so seriously and um, it shows. I mean, I, I love that he's ta- he takes a break after things. I, I love that. Well, he that's part of-, of it, too. I was going to say I was thinking, too, like because. His um his rise to fame and like his movie star years are pretty much right in the same time period as Jim Carrey. Totally. Like that was, they were yeah. like they were like the two, right? They were dominating at the same time. And I was thinking like, oh, you know what the difference is between him and Jim Carrey is that he didn't make it as easy to get sick of him. Yeah. Like Jim Carrey had more hits because he was just like pumping them out, but also that got to a point where people started to be ready to turn on him. Mm-hmm. And because I said he was also always on, like even in his interviews and everything, and it started to get to a point where like Oh, okay. The Jim Carrey shtick, you know, and the thing about Mike Myers is he would take these long breaks and also he wouldn't put himself out there that much. And so you kind of like, didn't, you didn't have a chance to get sick of him in the same way. Um, just a little side tangent though. I wanted to go come back to the gold member thing. Cause I was just sure. looking at this filmography and I was trying to think about, this is interesting to me. Cause I was thinking about like, why did I like number two so much at the time? And then just a few years later, not like gold member. And I mean, obviously part of that is I just think gold is not as funny, but also it tells you something about how quickly comedic trends can change. Because I think of like that that era of like 1999 when number two hits. Because obviously number two is a much raunchier, grosser movie than even the first one. Yeah. The first one has yeah. like the huge like the new endo, like you said. But really, the first one is really leaning in on the satire of 60s spy movies. And then Spy Who Shagman and Goldmember are more outrageous shock humor to a certain yeah. degree. Yeah. And 1999 was like the the period of that, right? That's like the American Pie era, which goes into things like Tom Cats and Saving Silverman. There's some about Mary. Suddenly we were like primed because I think maybe comedy had felt safe for a while in the, mm. in the early 90s. Suddenly we were ready for like raunchy, gross out humor. And I think this it burned out so fast. That by 2002, I think a lot of us were already done with it. I think that's a big part of it, too. Sure. Like, you, it only takes a few years and you get so many, like, the next American Pie wanna be, or, you know, the next, uh, well, I mean, all, all the movies I just mentioned were that. Yeah. But I think by that point, it's like, oh, all right, more of this, you know? So uh, that's probably part of it, too. Sure, sure. Back to, like, him taking breaks and stuff, just even to his later career. I think he's an actor that everybody gets excited to see if he shows up, even in the smallest roles. You know, like Inglorious Bastards or well, even uh, that shitty say, movie Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you say excited. I'll also counter sometimes baffled. Like, I, I do remember him being very distracting in Inglorious Bastards. I don't I mean, he's just doing that's he's kind of like the same in Inglorious Bastards as he is in Amsterdam. And that's yeah. interesting, too, now, because I feel like he's an actor at this point today who really doesn't have to work unless he wants to, unless something strikes his fancy. And, uh, and he joins these kind of big ensemble pieces, maybe just because he wants to work with those directors. But to me, sometimes it's very distracting when he shows up in those. And, and then it, that's like maybe the the downside of him not being very prolific is when you remove yourself from the Hollywood scene and you don't make that many movies. When you show up in something, it feels like, oh, my God, I haven't seen him in such a long time. It's kind of weird that he's in this. Mm-hmm. And I think that can happen sometimes, too, especially when he shows up in a more dramatic thing. Mm, that's fair. That's fair. And I guess maybe even him choosing to be in ensembles, he just doesn't want to like have the movie rest on his shoulders anymore. You know, like he's well. He, I mean, we'll talk, I mean, that's the, the theme of this month is probably going to be: Are these the two movies that created that? Yeah, you know? that's so, a good point. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a great segue. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's talk about this movie's development. Uh, yeah. I, I had mentioned before uh, how the Grinch stole Christmas comes out in two thousand, mega hit, and still a you know, Christmas classic. Yeah. Uh, I also ask, a movie that I, oh, you're going to ask me how I feel about it. I was going to, I was going to ask you how you felt about it. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I just mentioned how Jim Carrey got to a certain point where we were sick of him. That that might be a demarcation point right there. Okay. <laughs> the, I, I mean, obviously I love the original animated Grinch movie. I mean, I heck, it's, I'm a Boris Karloff fan, of course, uh, but just, I also like the story and the animation is great. Um, I find that Jim Carrey live action one, Oh, pretty aggravating. I think the whole thing with like the Grinch origin and like, you know, trying to explain why he's the Grinch. It's just yeah. it's another one of those things where it just felt I, I think I mean, without tipping the hat, the cat in the hat, um, <laughs> we're going to talk about this with our review. But Dr. Seuss's books are so compact and so direct and to the point that having to add on anything to make them feature length 
is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think the Grinch definitely buckles under the weight of that. I think Jim Carrey is, I don't want to say he's bad, Nick, because I don't think he's bad. He's giving one, he's giving it his all. He's giving one hell of like a, a manic, crazy comedic performance. Even if I wanted to go, my schedule wouldn't allow it. Four o'clock, wallow in self-pity. Four thirty, stare into the abyss. Five o'clock, solve world hunger. Tell no one. Five thirty, jazzercise. Six thirty, dinner with me. I can't cancel that again. Seven o'clock, wrestle with myself, loathing. I'm booked. Of course, if I bump the loathing to nine, I could still be done in time to lay in bed, stare at the ceiling, and slip slowly into madness. But what would I wear? Yeah. But it's I don't know that whole movie is just like so extra. If you know what I mean, that it, to me, it's it's kind of unbearable at times. I, I, I okay. So that's my long winded way of saying I don't like it. Sure, sure. Uh, again, I, I saw it at a different time, too. Like, I actually went to that movie on my 12th birthday party <laughs> with me and friends. And uh, like, I liked it back then. Uh, I still like it now. I've seen it many times. Uh, but it is long in the tooth. Like I'm not, yeah. it's it's undeniable that it shouldn't be an hour and 45 minutes long. And even by kids movie standards, that's pretty short anyways. But it, it is, it does, uh, it's stretched to the brim in that movie. Um, and the baby Grinch is one of the most horrifying things ever put on screen, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, like, but, yeah it, y- yes, 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 yes. But Jim Carrey is awesome in it. Like I, I really do like Jim Carrey's performance. I think he's, he's so, so wild in it that it's almost like I don't know it's it's something to behold you know and uh, I mean that leads into a little bit of what I'll, I'll say about this movie as well but I can see why they maybe thought hey this made a ton of money uh, Jim Carrey was outrageous he's a you know a crazy comedic performer that can do a ton of voices and does impressions oh also Brian Grazer is the producer hey let's just try to do this again you know, and as we've covered many times on our podcast, uh, <laughs> that usually doesn't work out because, yeah. you know, some things are just lightning in a bottle and um, critically or not with the Grinch, it, it was a success and it continues to be a classic, but with cat in the, fa- the cat in the fat, <laughs> <laughs> but the cat in the hat, you know, it just kind of. It existed, it, it it got developed, it got made, and then it's become, hell, I don't even think it's become memefied. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's just kind of been forgotten about in a lot of ways. But we should mention, though, too, that its development, though, does precede even the Grinch, like, coming out and being a hit. Like, this movie was in development before the Grinch hit screens. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, like, we should talk about that version because I was kind of fascinated to find out about this because we were talking about, like... You know, you just said it, and it's so true. Like, if if you put this, if you didn't know that this had a longer development period, it would seem like so obvious in your head. Oh, okay. Well, Jim Carrey's Grinch was just a huge hit. Who's the other big comic star of the moment that's kind of Jim Carrey-ish? Not only Canadian, but also yeah. just like that kind of performer. Oh, it's Mike Myers. So let's try it with him. The weird thing is that Mike Myers was not the original Cat in the Hat choice. No. In fact, this movie was developed by, at least partly developed by, and was set to star another comic star, but a, one of a very different energy. Uh, like, when, like I, I just like imagine. Well, it, it, let's just say who it is. Like uh, in 1997, production like began on this film, and at that point, it was supposed to be Tim Allen. Uh-huh. So Tim Allen was apparently like really gung ho about this movie, and I, we have to talk about this because I, I'm sure you saw it too. It's in like our in our like production notes and everything. Mm-hmm. That apparently Tim Allen's whole take on it was he loved the book as a kid, but he found the book to have like this really dark, scary edge. And that's what he wanted to like bring to the role. He, right. he kind of had this idea of like, I want I want to play the cat in the head. I want to play him as kind of like scary. And I think we can see how like a, that's somewhat maintained a little bit like that th- is a through line that never went away. Yeah. But yeah. I want to ask you just about that. And I also want to ask you to put on your like speculative shoes for a moment and join me in just wondering what the hell would the Tim Allen cat in the hat have been like? I mean, you have to remember Tim Allen was like family comedy royalty at this point. Yeah. I mean, the Santa Claus and he had like a number of like, he, he was like a Disney guy or he did like the, you know, like the, the Shaggy DA movie and Jungle to Jungle. Like he, mm-hmm. would, he was like a, in the pocket of like these kind of family comedies. So that part's not surprising. But then I just think of like Tim Allen as just a completely different kind of comedic presence than these two. 
Yeah, and we got to say first, uh, the only reason he dropped out of the role was because it was delayed too long and he had a commitment to Santa Claus 2. Yeah, so which we, is we, interesting because you know who else is in Cat in the Hat? Spencer Breslin. I know. And Spencer Breslin is in Santa Claus 2. Oh, you're telling me Spencer Breslin can clear his schedule and make <laughs> both these work, but Tim Allen can't? I mean, granted, Spencer Breslin's in like three scenes in Santa Claus 2, but still. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, a Tim Allen Cat in the Hat is um would he have played it like like smarmy you know it would have been completely different that's the thing where there's just no way to there's no way around it it wouldn't have been the same kind of performance like we haven't said yet what this mike myers performance is i'm sure people can kind of guess but the tim allen performance would have been a lot lower energy obviously it would have it would have been much much different i think you're right i think it would have been more sarcastic he would have been Mm -hmm. probably just more of like an asshole. And yeah, to be dick. fair, like for those who, if you've never read the book, Cat in the Hat. He's selling, that, he's selling Coke to the kids. <laughs> that, <laughs> that kind of is, that kind of is the point of the book, right? The Cat in the Hat is like, a, it's a very simple book about two kids who are stuck at home on a rainy day. Their mom is not there. They don't know what to do. And this cat shows up and won't leave. Like the, yeah. And he's just like, here, look at all the fun things we can do. And everything he wants to do that's fun is destructive. And they're trying to get rid of him and he just won't go. He brings in this box and unleashes thing one and thing two. They make more mischief. They're just destroying the house. And the whole story is just this cat. Like, who's won't he? This cat thinks he's like so fun. And, he's, and everyone wants to have fun with him. But he's just being kind of a dick. <laughs> so I get, <laughs> I, I kind of, I somewhat See, get what Tim Allen means about there being like that dark edge to it. But I think I have this feeling that he was like taking that a little too extreme. Just from oh, what oh, I you, read. Oh, oh you, you, you don't say. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I. Okay, I didn't go back and reread The Cat in the Hat by Dr. Seuss for this podcast. But I did go look at, you know, a little bit of the, you know, like a like a brief synopsis of the plot. Yeah. And, okay, the cat shows up. He's kind of annoying. He balances some stuff on his head. He crashes some things by accident or whatever. He makes a mess. Thing one and thing two make a bigger mess. And then he cleans up and he leaves. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, he's not like this, as we'll get into with the review... He is not some agent of chaos. No, he's not the Joker. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, so this Tim Allen take is interesting to say the least. It, it feels like maybe even like like it feels like what somebody would do on YouTube nowadays. You know, like make kind yeah. of like a like a parody dark cat in the hat trailer version. You know, but starring Tim Allen with a lot of the grunts from the, from from Home Improvement. <laughs> Uh, I mean, God knows, I, I hope and pray that they d- it got at least to like a makeup test with Tim Allen and that that yeah. footage is somewhere because I do want to see that eventually someday. Totally. Hopefully that gets leaked out there. Just smoking a cigarette, you know, just fucking <laughs> putting it, you know, putting them, out, putting them out on the kids' foreheads and shit. Um, yeah, so that falls apart. Uh, then they look at Will Ferrell and Billy Bob Thornton as well. I don't know how much uh, credence is in those two rumors, but... Alas. Yeah. Although, again, take for just a moment. Will Ferrell, whatever. Like that makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. But Billy Bob Thornton's Cat in the Hat, again, a movie I would watch immediately if I yeah. if that was offered to me. Well, now it's just Bad Cat in the Hat, right? Like that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Doing the Sling Blade voice. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So they finally get around to Mike Myers, and well, the reason they go to Mike Myers. This is <laughs> yeah. this is the best well, this is not the best part of the of the production which we will get to. But back in Myers SNL days, mm-hmm. he had the sketch um sprockets. By where, the way, by the way, low key, maybe my favorite recurring Mike Myers character. Oh, amazing, life. amazing, amazing. So, for people unfamiliar, I'm going to drop a clip. Welcome to Sprockets. I'm your host, Dita. Thank you very much for your kind applause on my entrance. I always like a warm hand on my opening. (laughs) Well, it's Oscar time, and I'm as happy as a little girl. We here at Sprockets would like to present our own alternative Academy Award show. It is called the Insane Academy Awards. <laughs> the Insane Academy Awards. Ah! 
Helping me tonight is fellow insane film enthusiast and my lover, Helmet. Please welcome Helmet Vosch. The conceit of the show is a German TV show host, and it's all about uh, parodying the German art scene. That's how mm-hmm. it is. And he has outrageous guests on, and it's just it's just a ball of a time. Well, anyways, Myers is going to make a movie based yeah. on that character. I remember this. I'm like, I remember this era when, like, for years, you kept hearing about the Sprockets movie. That was a movie that I was very invested in happening because I loved Wayne's World. I thought, like, he actually struck gold with his first SNL movie. I was so primed and ready for a Sprockets movie that I actually was, like, following the development news of this for years. Oh, wow. Yeah. They're going to make this movie, but then Mike Myers himself doesn't like his own script. So he cancels the movie entirely. And Brian Grazer, who is producing the film, is understandably pissed off. They have a deal in place. They're going to make this movie and Mike Myers pulls the plug last second and he says, I don't want to do it. They get this big, supposedly legal battle behind the scenes and it sounds like Mike Myers was obligated to be in the cat in the hat as per a settlement agreement Mm -hmm. because of the Sprockets cancellation. Yeah, kind of, kind of weird. Like you know, it, uh, I, I, from what I read, it does sound like once he had the role, he kind of did take to it. To it, I mean, it's not like it's. I don't think he was like miserable making this movie, sure. but it definitely would seem like it's not a, it's not a production he chased. You know, whereas like Tim Allen really wanted to do this. This was not a passion project of Mike Myers by any means. This was a, a legal obligation. Yeah, I think that's a great place to just talk about the movie proper. Let's do it. Somewhere over the horizon, in a place unlike any other. Hi, Mrs. Kwong. Hi. I'll be back in a couple of hours. Conrad and Sally Walden were inside listening to a few rules from their mother. No video games, no fighting, no answering the phone to City Morgue, and absolutely no one sets foot in the living room or else. But today, while she's away, someone special will show them how to play. (laughs) Who are you? Who? Me? Why, I'm the cat in the hat. (laughs) Hairball. Phenometer. That measures how fun you are. You guys are both out of whack. You're a control freak and you're a rule breaker. So what do we do? Mom says we're not allowed to let me remember. Come on, kids, you know you want to. Stop this right now! The fish is talking. But is he saying anything? No, not really. See, kids, I told you we could have fun. <laughs> now, no opening the crate. They're on a magical journey. Wicked cool. Let the 12-year-old drive. Oh, yeah. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where you'll find fun. <laughs> is there a cat in here? And adventure around every corner. Get ready to experience the ultimate game of cat and house. The mother of all messes. Mike Myers. <laughs> you need to clean this mess up. I'll try. You don't try, you do. Yes, ma'am. The cat in the hat. The plot. (laughs) If people don't know it already. In this live-action film based on the classic children's tale, the troublemaking cat in the hat arrives at the home of bored young Sally Walden and her brother Conrad while their mother is at work and before she hosts a company party later that evening. The family's pet fish objects to the cat's presence, but that doesn't stop the hat-wearing giant feline from trying to have fun no matter how much destruction is left in his wake. Yeah, pretty simple. This is the easiest one you've ever had to do. Plot yeah, synopsis probably, wise. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll go first and talk about... This is a first time watch for both of us, pretty sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went into this movie, I mean, I'm sure you did, because you, we mentioned how it's kind of forgotten. But what I did obviously remember was that this movie was pretty reviled when it came out. Yeah. Like, I, that's what I've always known is like people really did not this movie. It was a bomb. People hated it. I had heard before about how... Uh, Dr. Seuss's widow was like super unhappy with this movie. So I went in with that in mind and I start watching the film. And the thing I'm first immediately taken with is 
the like in terms of Bo Welch as the director, like we mentioned, Bo Welch is this you know classic, uh, you know excellent production designer who's worked on things like Edward Scissorhands with Tim Burton. He's worked with Barry Sonnenfeld, the Men in Black movies, and you could really sense that kind of like production design fantastical eye at play, uh, creating the Dr. Seuss world. And for a few minutes in the opening, I was kind of like keyed into this movie a little bit where I'm wondering, is this something I'm actually going to end up liking? Because I thought like Kelly Preston as the mom, um, Sean Hayes as her boss, Hank Humberflube, when you see like him at the first time, Alec Baldwin, he shows up as the mom's boyfriend, Larry Quinn, and even the kids, uh, Spencer Bresling and especially Dakota Fanning. I felt like they were all playing into this aesthetic that Bo Welch was creating very, very well. And I was like, oh, I actually kind of get what this therapist movie is going for. And then the, the the cat in the hat shows up. <laughs> and I think, the, oddly enough for me, the problem with the cat in the hat is the cat in the hat. Once Mike Myers shows up, this movie becomes... I don't want to... Like, aggravating is probably the right word, but it's, it's also, like I said, I, I use the word baffling already, but I want to use that word again because it really is a case where the entire time you're watching it, you are you just can't stop thinking about how inappropriate this movie is as a Dr. Seuss adaptation. Right. Like that's like it's just it's from his first appearance all the way to the end. And really that once he shows up, the movie is just like gung ho. of There's just nothing but cat in the hat scenes. And so much of the humor is pitched at a level that I was just like, ooh, no, 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 no. This is wrong. Mm. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. And and then on top of that, there's a certain kind of comedy movie, and I, I, I know we're going to talk about this because this, again, speaks to both Mike Myers and Jim Carrey. There's a certain kind of comedic character, and it's always like a red flag for those kind of comedians when they're given a character where they say, hey, the point of this character is that they're annoying. Now just go off. That's kind of like the worst thing you can tell a comedian like Mike Myers or Jim Carrey. Yeah, because they're going to take that to heart and they're just going to think annoying is funny and it's not. Guess what it is? Annoying. Yeah. And I yeah, this movie is just really, really annoying. And there are times where it gets so annoying that that almost becomes funny. Like at times <laughs> I was like my my girlfriend and I were kind of like laughing at how confused and annoyed we were by it. Yeah, totally. <laughs> but not totally. but that's obviously not what the movie's going for. So, yeah, I did find this to be like a, a just a confusing, bizarre uh, in and just annoying. That's my keyword for this episode. Annoying watch. Sure. Yeah. So. I'm going to read a couple of my notes, okay? Mm -hmm. So 17 minutes in, I've liked what I've seen. Mm -hmm. It's colorful, fun production design. It feels like a quirky, surreal little world. Yeah. Alec Baldwin is my favorite version of him. He's smarmy, he's comedic, and I like that he wants to fight this kid. Kelly Preston is stunning as usual. Dude, that look, the the Dr. Seuss mom look, that's working for her. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Um, Dakota Fanning has always been a child actor that just has the it factor. Uh, she's very good. And the David Newman score is playful and gentle and classically family friendly. That's what I wrote. Mm -hmm. And at that 17 minute mark, Drev, the cat shows up. (laughs) And then this movie just sort of happens to you. Yeah. Uh, You, you witness all of its absurdity. It's a movie where you have to point to the cops where it touched you. (laughs) It's so strange. It's so wild. It's like a surreal fever dream that, again, it's like one of those... I I understand what you're getting at. It's like, it's bewildering. It's, It's a movie that, like, do I hate it? I don't even know what it is. You know, like, you know... Is this a movie? <laughs> like, you know, like to me, like the good version of this, a movie I quite like. And I know, again, this is a very divisive movie, but like the good version of this is Freddy Got Fingered. A okay, movie yeah, that's yeah. like yeah. not a movie. And you're just like, what is this? And you realize it's just Tom Green getting like millions of dollars from a studio and playing like a prank on the studio. Totally. And being totally. like, I'm going to make like a like a movie that's not even a movie. you know. And also he was trying to like take the piss out of those gross out movies I talked about. Um but the problem is like that's like an original thing and you expect it from Tom Green. It's Tom Green doing what you would think a Tom Green movie would be. This yeah. is a Dr. Seuss movie. And that's the insane thing is because not only like I don't if this character just existed in its own original IP, it would probably still be pretty annoying. Yeah. But you do watch the whole movie just really like dumbfounded that anyone involved, that nobody on set ever at any point ever spoke up and said, 
Hey, is, are we maybe getting away from the spirit of Dr. Seuss? <laughs> <laughs> when the cat in the hat is uh, looking at a picture of their mom and it turns into like a fold, like a like a Playboy like fold out and his hat gets a boner. Uh, is that maybe not an appropriate joke for yeah. for Dr. Seuss when he talks about when he's singing a song and almost says that they cut off his balls? Is that maybe not the kind of joke that should be in a Dr. Seuss movie? You know, like, why did why did nobody ever speak up about any of this? All right, Nevins. Oh. Time to die. Cat, you scared him away. <laughs> Dirty hoe. I'm sorry, baby. I love you. Like it's so um, prioritized with being slapstick silliness that it just like completely loses itself. And you know, like again, these these people that are made made the movie are some of my comedy heroes. You know, like they are talented, funny fucking people. And this is just the wrong. This is the wrong movie. This is like the just everybody's making the wrong decision at the at at, at the wrong time. <laughs> like this movie becomes just a series of gags and sketches. It goes from one to the next to the next. The most thinly veiled plot, which is again, Dr. Seuss is fine. It's it's very thin plot and it's it hammers home the theme of what you're going for. But in this one, it's just I, I feel aggravating is the word for sure, but can I can I talk about the Grinch for a second here? Can I go back to that movie? Yeah, yeah. And because I, I think it's undeniable that I have. I think to it's relevant it. because I don't like the Grinch, but the Grinch is definitely more successful than yes. This. Yeah. And I think I think this is the reason why. Um, the Grinch has an actual arc. Mm-hmm. He learns a valuable lesson, you know, in you know empathy, love, humility. While in this movie, especially, and maybe even the source material, I'm not sure because we we've. we've gone so off the rails at this point with with who the cat is as a character well that's just it he's not a character you know he's he's chaos incarnate he is a caricature so now because he's just an annoying agent of chaos it's starting with such an uphill battle for people to 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 grasp onto this character and love him and want to see more of the cat at least with the grinch there's some heart to him you know a pun unintended you know, like there's this one is scenes thrown in a blender in search of a story. Yeah, I mean, that's this is ultimately when you watch this movie, you realize that honestly, beyond all the obvious problems on screen, this movie is already facing an uphill battle in that maybe the cat in the hat's just not the right story to be turned into a movie. Totally. Because like, even at 82 minutes, you're struggling because, as you just said, the Grinch as a story has an arc. But Cat in the Hat doesn't. I just, uh, before the before the break, I talked about what the Cat in the Hat story was. That's it. It's about a cat who shows up at a house, causes some chaos, cleans up, and then leaves. <laughs> and and that's it. And so when you decide to turn that into a feature-length film, you're faced with two options. One, to expand it, is you would either say, well, let's give the cat an origin. Where did he come from? Like, What's the what's the backstory of the cat? As they did with the Grinch in the Grinch movie. Yeah. Um, and maybe because they had just done it with the Grinch, they didn't want to do that again. Or maybe they felt like that would take away like the mystery of the character. So... They went with option two, which is, well, we have to expand the story of the kids and we have to create because there has to be a plot in this movie. So the plot now has to be about them and their like their family misadventures like this all has to be tying into larger family issues. So that's the thing. Um, The character arc is given to Conrad. Conrad is the, you know, the the younger brother. He's this like impulsive, um, never listens to his mom, rule breaker. you know, whereas Sally is the do-gooder. Sally mm-hmm. loves rules. She's got a little Blackberry and she writes a to-do list for the day. The last thing out is to do tomorrow's to-do list. You know, and that's that's her kind of character. And Conrad is a, is a little juvenile delinquent. And the, the arc is by the end of the movie, he needs to learn to be a better kid, essentially. And Sally yeah. needs to learn to have fun, too. But that's less important, you know. And so that's tied into this whole thing with, well, the mom's boyfriend, Alec Baldwin, wants to send Conrad away to military school and then we have to get into this whole thing about how he, the boyfriend is posing as the successful businessman, but really he's this deadbeat slob who has all his possessions repossessed and he's just using the mom. He wants to get married to the mom to take her money. And yeah. just like, what? What? <laughs> this is cat in the hat, right? Why am I getting so much of this? Like, it, don't get me wrong. Like you said, I love Alec Baldwin in this, mm-hmm. but uh, this, this doesn't belong in cat in the hat. Like if you're going to expand it, you probably should have expanded more on the cat side of it. You maybe should have given him a backstory, maybe kind of explain more where he came from because now it's like you're adding in all this stuff about the family. I don't care about. And then the cat is still just this weird character who shows up and raises hell. 
yeah. that's all he is. So it's a very it, it creates a very bizarre structure and narrative to this movie where you don't really give a damn about the the arc of the film, and then you just have this like I said this like Joker s character who's just showing up and taking over the movie, and you don't know why. Yeah, and like the way he's taking over the movie too is. It's a lot. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, like, like I, again, I love Mike Myers and I, I, and I do, I love all three of those awesome powers movies, but there's something here where he's just, he's doing too much, uh, Dr. Evil laugh, you know, and he's, he's doing too much. Like even when he walks, he's always like, just like flailing his limbs to the point that it just I don't know if Bo Welch like knows how to direct him doing this either because like the camera's so stagnant while he's doing something so crazy that it just doesn't like it doesn't work. I think it's off putting like even just on a visual level, you know what I mean? Like he's so wild and crazy, but this movie's filled with shot reverse shot. You know, like stagnant tripod, watch the two kids cut back to watch the cat do something cut back to watch the kids react to the cat yeah. and all and then and then at that point i think did they even film scenes together you know because what we find out is mike myers again let's remind you was contractually obligated to be in this movie against his will <laughs> and it sounds like he was kind of a pain in the ass yeah i was going to say like you mentioned the bow Welch not knowing how to direct him i think it's safe to say Mike Myers probably steamrolled Bo Welch on this yeah. a lot. And this, I wanted to get back to, I brought up earlier how his comedic hero is Peter Sellers. This is where I think he takes the wrong lesson from Peter Sellers because Peter Sellers was also known as being kind of an asshole, right? Very right. difficult to work with, you know, um, not as fun off screen as his on screen characters were. A perfectionist to the level of it's my way or the highway, kind of, you know, dictating things. And I'm sure you saw the same stuff I did saying that. Mike Myers on set would be telling Kelly Preston and Alec Baldwin how to deliver their lines. Cause he's like, this mm -hmm. is what would be funny, you know? And like, look, I, I, I'm Mike Myers is more of a comedic star than Alec Baldwin, but Alec Baldwin doesn't need to be told how to be funny. Alec totally. Baldwin just needs to be Alec Baldwin, you know? So yeah, it, it does. It, um, I think it's a shame that maybe Mike Myers takes like that from the, uh, from Peter Sellers too, of this, like this allowance. I think some comedians think it, that being funny is like an allowance to be an asshole too. Mm, like yeah. Jim Carrey has that to a, to a degree as well. If you've seen the documentary about him doing the Andy Kaufman movie and I right. get that he was trying to be Andy Kaufman, but there's still no call for how much of a dick he was making that movie, you know? So it's, it's like a shame when they, when they get that in their head. Can I, can I read you a little bit of, of uh, one of the co-stars? Yeah, um, please do. Her name is Amy Hill. She plays the nanny of, of the film. He was basically asleep the whole time, which was... Oh, my God. There are... Not to cut you off, but there are moments, like, again, you, you you get to a certain place where you just are trying to entertain yourself. <laughs> and yeah, part totally. of the way you do that is by, like, just misreading the film on purpose. But the movie's also kind of letting you. And I don't know about you, Chris, but the, she's asleep the whole movie, but I, like, I just assumed she was dead. And there's, like, so many... Like, because, like, the, the cat, like, hangs her up in the closet. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it really yeah. looks like he's just hanging up her corpse. And then later, they're riding her corpse, like, through, like, a water park. And I'm just like, this is, like, some dark shit here. Yeah, man. yeah. <laughs> so so here it is about uh, Hill Divulge... This is from 2016, by the way. Um, The, the article, obviously. Uh, Hill divulged how wholly unpleasant it was to work with Myers behind the scenes. She goes off to say, He is like a little hermit. He would come in and, I guess, be in hair and makeup. I'd be there at the crack of dawn waiting. We would all be waiting for Mike Myers to come. He had his handlers dress his trailer, and his area was all covered with tenting because he didn't want anybody seeing him. It was so weird. It was just the worst. It was like I was there forever, and my daughter was two and a half, and I felt like I was missing her first everything. I was miserable. I just thought it was really rude of him to not take all of us into consideration. Sidebar. Rick Baker... Famous, famous Rick Baker, master makeup artist, was supposed to do this film. Mm -hmm. He did The Grinch. He made all the, the awesome prosthetic work in The Grinch. Well, he was making this movie, and he actually left the production because of this behavior. Mm -hmm. So in the pre-stages of the film, Mike Myers was showing up late, was not happy, was being a diva. So Rick Baker actually passed the duties over to one of his, uh, I think one of his underlings. And I think it, it shows. Was, well, 
Yeah, I mean, the underling he passed off to is Steve Johnson, who in his own right is still like one of the one of the top sure. guys, you know. Yeah, but Steve Johnson worked on things like American Werewolf in London, Ghostbusters, Fright Night, Big Trouble in Little China. But here's what I will say is as someone who kind of follows the whole horror special effects VFX world, mm -hmm. Steve Johnson has a he is a he's a protege of Rick Baker has a totally different um, energy and mentality. Yes. Yeah. And Steve Johnson strikes me as someone who probably was like a better match for Mike Myers because he probably didn't, like Rick Baker is like, um, he was like a, he's like a sweetie pie, like a little bit, you know what I mean? <laughs> totally and he probably totally. was like, and like, that's not the right energy. Steve Johnson, I say this lovingly, kind of an asshole, like a lovable asshole. And I right. bet you he either gave it back or just like, you know, I bet you he didn't like put up with it. So it was like a better match. Yeah, totally. Um. Trev mentioned that, you know, maybe Mike Myers was uh, secondhand directing everybody. Well, again, back to this article, Amy Hill uh, says this. Mike would do a take, and then he'd go over and look at the monitors, and then he'd talk to the director, and then we'd do another take. It was just a horrible, nightmarish experience. I don't think he got to know anybody. He'd just be with his people and walk away. People would come, and then he'd stand there. There was a guy who held his chocolates in a little Tupperware. Whenever he needed chocolate, he'd come running over and give him a chocolate. That's what divas are like, or people who need therapy. <laughs> All I now, picture you... now is that is that big cat just in the in the in the corner of the room on like a one of those like crew member chairs, just being fed delicately truffles. <laughs> now, do you think that part of like uh, if you extrapolate this, do you think part of the problem is that this is now a post Wayne's world and post Austin powers and even post the first Shrek, Mike Myers. Like, is that where the diva attitude is coming from? Like this is him at, on the top at the, on the top of the world. Right. And his yeah. fall hasn't happened yet. It's about to, but is that the maybe, problem or at least part of it, maybe, maybe a bit of it. And then also, ah, oh man, I have a little bit of a theory. Like, do you, do you, do you think he sabotaged this movie? I don't know. Like, cause like, what is, what does sabotaging this movie mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I honestly don't. Well, cause he didn't want like, to do it. He didn't want to do it. And but... he never, and Mike Myers truly does not do something he doesn't want to do. You know what I mean? But, he, like you said, he's at the top of his game right now. He does not have to do friggin' cat in the hat. Yeah. I don't know. Like the, the only reason I would like, like buckle against that theory is because you and I obviously don't like this performance. We find it to be, just I don't know I don't even know how to describe it. It's in the it's in the wrong it's just in the wrong movie entirely. Just it's the in the wrong, wrong movie. Wrong, wrong. Yeah, but it's not a low energy. You know he's not phoning it in. That's what I'll say. Like yeah, he's not for what it is. He's giving it his all. And I know like I'm, I I bet a lot of our listeners are thinking that's cat in the hat. I bet there's no way that uh, Mike Myers gets to do his beloved Scottish accent. <laughs> oh oh no, listeners, don't worry. He gets <laughs> to do his Scottish accent. Um. So, yeah, I think he's like, I think he's giving it his all. I, I do think that because here's what I here's where I'll go off of your theory. I don't think he's sabotaging the movie, but because he didn't want to do it and because he didn't really care about the role, that's probably why he didn't mind pissing on the Dr. Seuss of it all hmm. and being like, yeah, it's, I don't like whatever. Let's do like dick and fart jokes and, and boner jokes like that. It, that's let's make it into a Mike Myers movie. Like, if you're going to make me do this, then I'll do a Mike Myers movie. I don't want to make it. I'm not going to care about it being a Dr. Seuss movie. Sure. And that's really the problem, because, like, I'm no prude or anything, but I'm at least respectful enough to know that 70 percent of these jokes should not be in a, in a Dr. Seuss movie. And I don't blame his widow for watching this and just like losing her shit, you know, and, yeah. and being very upset about this and saying, no, you can't make any more of these live action movies if that's what you're going to do. Can I can I mention two times that I did chuckle? <laughs> like, I, only have, I, I have I only have one. So you mentioned your okay. two, and my I don't like my one is very weird, but I want to see what yours. Are. Okay, my two were um, I laughed at the uh, the cupcake bit, you know, like the infomercial thing. It just got so audaciously absurd mm -hmm. that I was like, I can't believe they're burning one hundred million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought that was like really, I thought, I actually thought that was quite funny. Like I, I think Mike Myers is totally off the chain. He's playing three different cats in the, uh, in the scene and he keeps threatening one of them that he's going to kill him, which I thought was funny. Okay. Dr. Seuss. Yes. Yes. No, definitely not supposed to be in the movie, but for my own pleasure, uh, I thought that was funny. Now. Here to tell us about his astounding product for making cupcakes, all the way from Cheshire, England. Please welcome me. Hello. <laughs> now, 
<laughs> Hello, Ari. I'm so excited! Do you love making cupcakes but hate all the hard cupcake work? I know I do. <laughs> Don't forget everything you know about making cupcakes. And say hello to the amazing cupcake in it. I'm so excited! <laughs> cupcake or what? Cupcake in it! Oh, this amazing device can instantly make cupcakes out of anything that you have in the kitchen. Wait a minute, did you say anything? Anything. Anything. Yes, anything. 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 I'll get you, and I'll look like a bloody accident. And the second one was so strange. When, um... <laughs> okay, um... They go to a children's birthday party, and it looks like he's got to hide, and this pinata <laughs> looks, looks like him a little bit. So, instead of hiding, he strings himself up in the pinata. He looks like he's hanged himself. It's so, that was a moment where me and my girlfriend just looked at each other like, oh my God, oh, I can't so believe this is a visual I'm seeing in a kid's movie. Oh my God, it was so funny. And then, and then uh, Beans from Even Stevens shows up to, to hit him in the nuts. And then as he's screaming, it cuts to him. Like in like this like this like uh, little house in the prairie dream sequence swinging on a swing with a with a white horse behind him and I was like this is so insane. Yeah, this easy like Sunday insane. morning starts playing. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah yes, I mean I'll, those two I, those two were funny for for me. So. I didn't laugh at that, but I actually did appreciate that as just a moment of like that was almost like the kind of joke that would just be in like a wet hot American summer. Totally, or we're like we're like what? Like that is just so weird for especially for this movie. No, the, oh, that's funny. The, what's funny is like you laughed at like actual attempts of like humor. Yeah. Here is the only thing that made my girlfriend and I both laugh watching the movie. And we even looked at each other like in amazement that we're like, that's what made us laugh in this movie. And it's only like three seconds long. And it's a moment where they, the movie just suddenly cuts to Alec Baldwin in his convertible pulling up to like the mom's place of work. And as he's pulling up, he's just like maniacally laughing. <laughs> And that was like so funny. And like, I would instantly, I was like, I just want that as a clip to like use all the time because it's just, it's, it's Alec Baldwin giving his great, like bad guy laugh, but doing it as he's parking his convertible for no reason. Like it just cuts to him laughing like that, pulling into a parking spot. And that was like so random. And that's like what made me laugh. And that's probably not a great sign when that's like my only genuine laugh in Cat in the Hat. Totally. Um, speaking of Alec Baldwin, uh, he, he's obviously the best performance in the, in the movie, I, I, I think, right? Is he, is he I'd say best? him, and like I said, I also think not like Sean Hayes. Oddly enough, has two roles in this. He's the voice of the fish, but then I really do. It's a smaller part, but I really like him as Hank Humberflube, the germphobic yeah. boss. I think he's like I. I mean, I just like Sean Hayes in general, but I think he's like also pitched at like a great level in this. Mm -hmm. so. But I think Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin is the MVP. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, especially yeah. that's well another thing that kind of got me to chuckle, but also cringe, is when it's revealed that he's just some fat piece of trash guy mm -hmm. you know and his his stuff's getting repoed and his his belly's hanging out and then the people leave his house and he like gets up and he starts to put his finger in his belly button and he makes this like disgusting face of like euphoria <laughs> it's so terrible but yes i have to ask you quinn his character sometimes sees the cat sometimes doesn't see the cat and I gotta ask you, because my rule alarm in even the cat in the hat, Trev, was going off. What are the rules? What are the rules? What are the rules? What are the rules? Does it matter? Who gives a shit? Let me let well, me know your thoughts. Well, Chris, as uh, the podcast's resident rules expert <laughs> or, or rules stickler, there was a moment in this movie that I couldn't wait to ask you about and, and get your thoughts on. Because in this movie... Uh, the cat just shows up. We don't know where it came from, but he eventually brings in the box. And we know the box from the original source material. This is the box that Thing 1 and Thing 2 are in. And that is the case here, too. And don't worry, we'll get to Thing 1 and Thing 2. We do have to talk about them. But what we do learn is that the box is actually, uh, in this movie, it's like a portal. It's a portal to another universe. Ostensibly, like, it's the Cat and the Hat's universe. It's where he comes from. So you're like, oh, okay, so, like, this universe, like, the universe we're in, oddly enough, even though it's very seussical, if that's a word, um... It's it's also heavily insinuated to be like our world. Like there's a scene where the babysitter puts on TV and she's watching Taiwanese parliament and she's actually like yelling at it and going, no more big government. Again, exactly what kids want to see in a cat in the hat movie. 
Yeah. Uh, but, but they're also like jokes that basically say this is the United States. They, they reference other, they reference certain states and things. It's like, okay, so this is happening in our world. And the cat and the hat and thing one and thing two come from a different world. Okay. And that's only in their box. Like that box is the portal to another dimension. Then there's a scene later where they go into like the town square and they're trying to get away from Alec Baldwin, who's chasing them because he doesn't want them, doesn't want the mom to find out that he's like this piece of shit. And he's, so he's trying to get the kids, Mm -hmm. um, whole convoluted thing. And there's like some kind of like, um, like a phone box or something in the middle of the town, the town square. And they open it and go into it. And suddenly they're inside a giant underground nightclub (laughs) where Paris Hilton is dancing. (laughs) That's hot. 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 And the cat in the hat like wants to fuck Paris Hilton because again, that's of course going to be in a Dr. Seuss movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they come out of that and another and, and they pop out of it in another part of the town square. Chris, yeah, what the hell? <laughs> like, what? How did? Why was there an underground nightclub in this town if that's not part of the box that's like a portal to the cat's dimension? Yeah. What is going on in that part of the movie? You're you're also forgetting to mention that half the patrons at the club are wearing the hat that the cat yeah. wears. Like, did he did he create this sub universe? Like, did he did he decide to manifest this this and also manifest Paris Hilton? Well, I mean, if you can manifest Paris Hilton, that's hot. 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 <laughs> Um, I also forget to mention that when they get out of that, because you mentioned how everyone else is wearing the hat, they come out of that club and he's like, oh no, the hat I'm wearing isn't my hat. It got like, it got switched. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, okay. And like, I think that's like the first time the movie's insinuating that like he needs the hat for any reason. Like that, like, because it's it's never been established before that the hat gives him any kind of powers. He's like, oh, I I lost my hat. The hat's his mojo. And then you think like that's going to matter. And then like 10 minutes later, he's like, no, I'm, I was lying. I was always wearing my hat. And I'm like, what? Why? Yeah. Why do we even have that scene? Then? <laughs> well, even even at the end when he when he does uh, decides to tell the kids that he orchestrated the whole thing and he was like this master puppeteer and everything that happened happened because of him. Like, is, is the cat in the hat God? Like, is that's what's <laughs> happening now? He's and that would explain the underground club. Now he's just God. <laughs> one of our all-time great religious movies cat in the hat yes 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 all right i also chris i i said we'd get back to this in a movie that is i would say f- full of nightmare fuel like this is a nightmare fuel movie this is like you for the care the term kinder trauma um you know the kind of like t- tv shows and and movies that you would see as a kid and there'd be certain things that would just give you nightmares and stick with you for a whole life yeah you know people a lot of people often talk about seeing like um the clown doll under the bed in Poltergeist or, you know, things in like, just there are certain kid movies that have moments like that, you know, um, right. Just something that scares the hell out of you. And then that re- becomes a recurring scare. When thing one and thing two come out of that box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how horrifying are thing one and thing two in this? Well, like, again, I go back to that prosthetics thing with Rick Baker and then Steve Johnson. It just, it's not their best work. That's it's, <laughs> it feels like to, children are wearing masks, you know, and, and the masks are not cute. They're not, they're just, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Horrifying. Horrifying is probably the word. Yeah. Yeah. And especially when they become CGI doubles for a lot of it running around and becoming menaces. Uh, yeah, it's not, they're not, they're not great. I I also like the idea of, of Steven Spielberg watching this movie with Dakota Fanning in mind and being like, Oh man, she, this is the most terrifying movie. Let's let's put her in War of the Worlds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she somehow survived Cat in the Hat, so clearly she can deal with the trauma of uh, everything in War of the Worlds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you mentioned earlier the um, the infomercial scene, and, like, I wasn't as into it as you are, but I will say, because you mentioned I was playing three characters in that point, and the, the infomercial host, that very much felt like a Mike Myers character. Like, you're right, for, like, a moment oh, yeah. there, it's like, oh, this is like an SNL skit. Like, I could see him playing, without the cat makeup, he's doing like a very good parody of those kind of infomercial hosts. In fact, Mm -hmm. I'm sure he probably has done that, you know, without the cat makeup as its own thing. That's why he brought it into the movie. I was pretty confused. Did you get like what exactly he was going for with like the redneck mechanic character? No, 
when no, he becomes a, he becomes this like redneck mechanic who has to fix the couch. That whole scene was so strange. Like the voice he's doing, it felt like he was mocking something in particular, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And then it just gets even weirder where then it's like, OK, so I guess the joke is he's this redneck mechanic. He bends over. He's got butt crack showing. And then he like starts fighting an elephant that's in the couch. I'm like, I'm like, what? We've we've gone off page. Here. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what is happening. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was well, I mean, there's a lot of bits that fall flat, but that one especially was the I don't want to say troublesome one, but the one that you're you're actively uh, you're wanting to turn the movie off. Because mm-hmm. it's just you, you, nothing is gelling. There's nothing coming together. And it cuts back to the children. It always cuts back to the children, by the way. Mm-hmm. And their reactions are always just like they're not acting anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like these are children watching a madman. And uh, again, funny people made this movie. And nobody thought to say, hey, that elephant in the couch that's strangling Mike Myers as a redneck mechanic is totally falling flat. Let's just take the scene out. You and I love to talk about editing. Yeah. And this is a movie that I was, I was watching. I was actually thinking about editing a lot, not because it's a well-edited movie, because it's not. You and I, you were just talking about how it's a lot of just shot, reverse shot. Yeah. But I was watching it thinking about how, at a certain point, Bo Welch and his editor sat there watching all this footage and put it together, <laughs> put this cut together when thinking like, yeah, yeah, that's good. Leave that in. That That's mm-hmm. like good for our comedy. That'll get a laugh. Like, that's what was like baffling to me. It's like that... I, you have to wonder, you know, obviously it's the kind of thing where you wouldn't admit it. You won't talk about it. But is this the kind of movie where like Bo Welch was putting all the footage together and just being like, oh, no, like, oh, has to I be. guess I guess we have to use that. But like he had to have like the sinking feeling, right? Like just knowing, oh, no, this is this is unsalvageable. Yeah. And, and honestly, like probably realizing, hey, like maybe features aren't for me. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> like, Well, if he didn't, I mean, if he didn't realize it, the box office, I think did yes. that for him. Yeah. And, yes, the, and yes. the overall reception to the movie. Well, I think that's a great place to talk about what happened afterwards. Um, the sequel to the original book, The Cat in the Hat Comes Back, was in development for uh, a, you know, about a month before this movie comes out. Uh, then Seuss's widow uh, is so critical of the film, she puts the kibosh on all live-action movies, anything in development, any retellings, absolutely not. Uh, stop pissing on my, uh, <laughs> on my uh, husband's grave. Well, in March of 2012, uh, the Cat in the Hat remake is announced by Universal Pictures because uh, widow Audrey Geisel allows uh, work in the animation field. And this is because of the success of the Lorax. Um, And then in 2018, the Warner Animation Group says, guess what, Trev? They're making the DSCU, the Dr. Seuss Cinematic Universe. And uh, the Dr. Seuss Enterprise president, Susan Brandt, spoke out on the deal. I love this quote because it just kind of encapsulates our entire podcast. Um, For the first time, we're not just doing one film for one book. We're going to franchise build beyond the initial story of these books and find out what happens next. I call it stretching the fabric. How far can it go to go a little bit deeper with our characters? Does, has anybody in Hollywood ever taken notice of how thin a Dr. Seuss book is? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like they're like they're like 20 pages. I don't know. Like here's the it's it's it is like um kind of surprising to me that like the reception of this movie was so negative that you know we have we've had a we've had a Grinch like animated reboot since the Grinch movie. And like nothing with Cat in the Hat. Like you said, they, they tried. Like in 2012, they almost did it. 2018, they announced it again. But we still haven't really got any like forward momentum on it. But I will say this to like this whole idea of this like Dr. Seuss universe. They're at least right. And I think Audrey Geisel is right that Dr. Seuss is better suited to animation. Mm-hmm. If anything, like I know you're into the Grinch more than I am. But I think to me, like the one two punch of Grinch and then especially Cat in the Hat does show that not only for the length of the stretch of two, but there is just something, I don't know, like really aesthetically unpleasing about seeing these characters in live action. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, that totally. like, like I think the cat in the hat makeup is actually pretty impressive for turning Mike Myers into a cat. I think Jim Carrey's Grinch makeup is pretty in- incredible, yeah. but it's still like you look at it and there's like this like uncanny level to it that it just doesn't feel right. So I'm, I'm definitely more into the idea of like animated Dr. Seuss, yeah. but I'm not into the idea of saying, let's take these very short 
simple books that obviously that honestly just mostly for the most part are fun and remembered and beloved because of the wordplay. Yeah. Because of the wordplay and the, and the, and the images, of course the art is great, but like the silly wordplay. And then let's turn that into like some epic shared universe where we have to really stretch this. She's saying in the quote, she's admitting we have to stretch the plots out. We have to like <laughs> add shit in. That's not there. And that's not a good idea. Like not everything needs to be a cinematic franchise. Why can't Dr. Seuss just remain the fun books that parents read with their mm-hmm. kids Did or you... t- like the occasional TV special? Totally. Totally. Um, well, yeah, the original Grinch is the 1966 version is like 26 minutes, right? Like it's, it's yeah. like under half hour. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, have you seen the Grinch, uh, remake? Like the, I have not, the, no. no, uh, the one that oddly way, enough, like Scott Mosher did. Yeah. I was about to say, because you mentioned yeah. David Mandel, you know, was helped with the clerks show. Well, mm-hmm. Scott Mosher is uh kevin smith's well old uh producing partner so yeah weird he, i know i i remember when i used to listen to the podcast he was big in animation and he worked for disney for a long time and so it was kind of cool that he got to make that movie uh it was a big hit huge hit so it was a big hit i just remember seeing the trailer and like not at all liking the voice that benedict cumberbatch was doing as right. the grinch you yeah. know especially when you've, you've had boris karloff you know doing the voice of the totally, you know, the totally. So, yeah. yeah well i mean <sighs> I got nothing else to say about Cat in the Hat. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you were wait, if you've been waiting your whole life to watch a Cat in the Hat movie where the Cat in the Hat almost brains a kid to death with a baseball bat until other kids step in and stop him, this is the movie for you. Yes. If, however, that sounds like something you should not see in your life, then you are a sane person. Yeah. And I would recommend not bothering with this movie. Yeah. I don't know it's weird because like there is a part of me that almost feels like everyone should see it at least once because it really is one of those like what the hell happened here movies. Yeah. Definitely. So like, that's the thing. Like if you feel like you can tolerate to that degree, you will at least be oddly fascinated by it. Cause I was, I can't say I was like, I wasn't like mad that I watched it. I'll never watch it again. Sure. But at least, but I did have an experience of being like, well, I'm glad I saw that now just to, just to be able to bathe in the, <laughs> the experience of the, what was that? No, I, I completely agree. That's why when yeah. I, when I walked out of it, well, when I walked out of it, when it was over, I, I sat there being like, well, I'm not like angry, you yeah. know, like for, for all these years, I've heard horror stories of people watching the cat in the hat and how, mm-hmm. how terrible it is. And oh my God, it's unwatchable and this and that. And, and I'm not trying to defend the movie, no. but I feel like the movie is like, so not a movie that I can't even, I don't even know. I don't even know how to rate it. Like, I don't even know yeah, how to, it's, how many, it's, how many stars do you give cat in the hat? Like, I have no idea. It's, it's not that it's unwatchable because that's not true. It's only 80 minutes and it's, you're consistently like, you can't, you can't tear your eyes off the screen. No, you can't. <laughs> so it's, it's not unwatchable. It's more that it is, like you said, after a legitimately kind of engaging and likable first 15 minutes, the rest of it is so amazingly misguided <laughs> that that's what it is. Like that's like, so it's not unwatchable. It's just, you watch the whole thing being like, Oh my good Lord. Every decision that's being made is wrong. Yeah. At this point. Like that. So it becomes, you know, it, I, I don't, I wouldn't put this on the same level as like the, the great bad movies, like the room or a troll Two. you know, that you, that you could get a group together and watch and have a lot of fun with. It's not quite that, but it's, it's more along those lines Yeah. where you yeah. just kind of need to see it at least once to be like, okay, I, I can check that off. I, Cause it really is. It's like Hollywood hubris. It's, um, unchecked ego it's getting the wrong star for the wrong movie forcing them to make a movie they don't want to see there's yeah. so many like interesting things about this movie that all convalesced into whatever the hell this is again again you you have to witness it that's yeah. that's how it is you just have to witness this movie it's it's like again it's a weird almost avant-garde experiential film at times especially when like they're in the amusement park type stuff and they're they're riding that dead body and, and then like maybe alec baldwin dies it's it's wild. Um, it's not. You're already saying witness is the right word. As I watched it, I took I took silver spray paint, sprayed it all over my teeth. I was like, "Witness me!" And then I just exploded while watching. It. <laughs> totally. So that's the cat in the hat. Um, uh, I I you know what? If you haven't seen it, like like Trev said, it's 80 minutes. Like just yeah. throw it on. It, throw it on. Next episode in Mike Mayer's, we are jumping five years ahead into the future to 2008 to watch The Love Guru. Um, yeah, I am unsure about all of it. 
<laughs> have, have you seen the love guru before i think i've seen it okay i know like, i have not i i know i've seen certain scenes which i will uh talk about on the podcast and uh my uh, recollection of watching that well here's all i'll say like i haven't seen it i obviously remember like the trailer i remember pointedly deciding not to see it yeah um here's my prediction chris you can tell me on your limited knowledge if i'm right okay I'd say my main concern going into Love Guru is I feel like maybe it's a problematic movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just going to go on, I'm, I'm no, gonna go on a limb and say this might not. Okay. Okay. You're, 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 pro- you're promising fine. me. It's fine. Okay. I'll take yeah, it. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to get shadow banned or something. <laughs> I'm watching that movie. Uh, so follow along at F2 F pod. That's at F2, the number two F pod on all the socials. Like us there, like us everywhere. Uh, rate, review, whatever you do. A star rating would be awesome. And uh, just join the tribe and hit that subscribe. Uh, thanks for listening along with my voice today. <laughs> um, uh, you know what? I do it for the fan. You know, I really do it. I do it for this the, is the this fans. Is, this is the part where you tell the truth and you admit that this is not because of the Stanley Cup. This is because of how much you were laughing while watching Cat. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs>